Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's mini lecture. This week, we'll be discussing chapter five in our textbook, and uh, it will go over the topic of physical growth, health, and nutrition. I'm just going to go ahead and get started because there is a lot of information to cover, and I am trying to keep this mini. <laughs> Okay, so our learning objectives for this week are to describe visible changes in the developing body from birth to age three, discuss how the infant and toddler brain develops, explain how adverse childhood experiences, also known as ACEs, can disrupt healthy growth of the body and brain, give examples of actions that promote health and safety during the first three years, and compare the nutritional requirements of infants and toddlers and discuss the problem of malnutrition from birth to age three. So it's in the title, but an overview of what we will be going over is physical growth, health and safety, and then nutrition and feeding. So first, we are going to start with physical growth. We're going to start with measuring and predicting growth. Growth during the first three years of life is faster than at any point after birth. Uh, and the WHO, the World Health Organization, um, has growth charts in which most pediatricians recommend that you follow those WHO growth charts if you are trying to track growth. I do have to say that every child grows at its their own different pace. Um, so just not to take growth charts too, too seriously, unless there's a red flag noted from the pediatrician. Um, there is this, it's not a concept, but it is, it's a thing. It's called failure to thrive. Um, infants without physical contact may grow slowly, even if they're fed an adequate diet. So there was this case study. Ooh, I don't remember complete specifics. Um, so take this with a grain of salt. However, the case study had um, a three or four-year-old who was the size of a two-year-old. Um, no matter how much mom uh, fed this child or how much the doctors or how many hospital stays she had and um, got like IVs and um, feeding tubes and everything, no matter how many calories they put into this child, this child did not seem to grow at an expected rate. Um, and it was later found out that this child lacked physical contact, lacked the cuddling and hugging um, from their caregivers. So because of this, the child's growth was stunted. Um, very interesting. If you would like to research more about it, we do have a second literature review. Um, I'm very fascinated by it. Uh, but moving on, so being moved to a new caring environment often triggers a dramatic growth spurt. Um, you'll see failure to thrive in orphanages and um, low quality orphanages, I should say, um, most commonly. And see our weekly readings for more information on this topic. So we have physical growth, we have the brain. Uh, the brain develops very rapidly during the first three years. I mean, the brain develops pretty rapidly in the womb as well. But um, neurons are produced and then migrate during the prenatal period. And then postnatal, so after birth, the brain growth primarily consists of the interconnection of neurons and the formation of synapses involving axons and dendrites. Um, so most of the growth from the brain is occurring within the brain, if that makes sense. If those synapses are connecting um, and are creating new and lasting memories and connections. Uh, different regions of the brain develop most rapidly at different ages. Uh, that is why critical and sensitive periods exist. Um, and that is also why they say that your brain does not finish developing until age 25, 26, because that is when your prefrontal cortex has finally completely developed. Um, 
then it's all downhill from there. But that is a topic for your brain in cognition course, not for infant and toddler development. Um, so pruning of synapses, which essentially is getting rid of synapses or connections that aren't used consistently within the brain, begins at the end of the first year of life. So the first year of life, synapses are just being built and built and built and built. And then at the end of the first year, around nine-ish to 11, 12-ish months, um, then the brain starts to prune. So it starts to get rid of connections that it does not deem necessary. Um, experience activates neurons and repeated experiences strengthen neural networks. They strengthen those synapses. So the more an experience is repeated, uh, the more, the bigger effect it has on the child's brain and the connections within its brain. Maltreat uh, maltreatment in the brain. So adverse childhood experiences, also known as ACEs, that is how I, what I will refer to them as from now on, are uh, potentially traumatic events experienced before the age of 18 years. So back in the, before the, before the 90s, um, in the 80s, experts were starting to get an idea of this in the 70s. Um, they're also kind of developing this idea, but before then, Experts thought that it did not matter if children experienced traumatic events during childhood because their brain was had this plasticity um, so that they could overcome these traumatic events without any lasting effects. Um, we have since proven that to be incorrect. Um, and the leading causes of traumatic events or ACEs include maltreatment, violence in the home or community, housing instability, and living in a household whose members had substance abuse problems, mental health problems, or suicidal behavior, or were in jail and prison. So the infant brain is especially vulnerable to injury caused by um, abusive head trauma. This is previously known as shaken baby syndrome. So it's when you shake a baby very viciously. Um, it shakes their brain uh, and can lead to lasting brain damage. Um, I also, with the ACEs, forgot to mention that children with many ACEs often experience toxic stress, which can lead to long-term physical, cognitive, social, and emotional delays and abnormalities. So there is this longitudinal study, it's called the Bucharest Early Intervention Project, uh, which began in the fall of 2000, and it seeks to examine the effects of early inst institutionalization, aka um, orphanages, on the brain and behavior development, and to examine the impact of high quality foster care as an intervention for children who have been placed in institutions. Um, this study has showed that early adversity changes in the developing, uh, let me repeat that, the study has shown that early adversity changes the developing brain structure and functioning. So ACEs literally rewire and change the way that the brain develops. It's nuts. Moving on to health and safety, we have newborn screening. So all newborns in the United States are screened for PKU, uh, congenital hyperthyroidism, galactosemia, and congenital hearing impairments. So newborn screenings identifies conditions that can affect a child's long-term health or survival. Uh, early detection, diagnosis, and intervention can prevent death or disability and enable children to reach their full potential. Normally, these screenings are just blood tests uh, taken from the child's heel. However, they can look different depending on um, each pregnancy, birth, and child.
Moving on to infant mortality. Uh, infant mortality rates in the United States vary by race and ethnicity. However, the leading cause of infant mortality in the United States are congenital malformations and preterm birth or low birth weight. Um, infant mortality is also linked to poverty, inadequate, inadequate prenatal care, uh, complications of pregnancy, malnutrition, lack of clean drinking water, and low rates of immunization against childhood illnesses and diseases. Common illnesses and immunizations. So immunizations against childhood illnesses and diseases save lives uh, and protect the health of the child, the family that is with the child, um, and those involved in the child's everyday lives. Uh, so there's also accidental injuries is a common, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Just a common thing to happen. So unintentional preventable injuries are the leading cause of death for children between the ages of one and four. Um, as babies and toddlers develop and gain new skills, parents need to be aware of and anticipate new hazards. A way that you could tell or um, help parents remember this is to teach them about the three A's, which are assess, anticipate, and act, and they can help keep infants and toddlers safe. Um, another big leading cause of uh, injury or death is burns, um, but burns from like cup of noodles, um, not even stove, like touching a hot stove or something like that. It's like wanting to eat a cup of noodles or just leaving a hot tea out or something like that. So it's very, very important that parents and caregivers are aware of where they are placing hot items so that children cannot reach them. Um, yeah, that is my little side note for that. Uh, sudden infant death syndrome uh, is the diagnosis given when an infant younger than one dies and a complete investigation and autopsy is unable to identify a specific cause. Uh, it commonly happens in infant sleep um, and there may have been, they may have found a link to a specific gene um, that makes it more likely for an infant to suddenly die. Um, however, research is still coming out on this. So this is not like a proven thing. It's just a possibility. Also, accidental suffocation and strangulation in bed, ASSB, is the diagnosis given for suffocation by soft bedding, wedging, or entrapment between two objects, strangulation, or overlay by another person while sleeping. Uh, the Safe to Sleep Public Health Campaign recommends that parents and other caregivers place all healthy babies on their back to sleep and avoid the use of soft bedding so that baby does not accidentally suffocate themselves. Um, also to avoid other risk factors uh, such as maternal smoking, sleep in an overhead heated room, and bed sharing. So here is an infographic um, from the NIH about safe to sleep for your baby. Um, if you click, you can click on the infographic and it uh, will open up to the actual <laughs> PDF of the infographic. They also, if you just go to safe to sleep, uh, I believe it's .com or .net or something like that. Um, .gov, actually, I think. Uh, they have a ton of different infographics and a ton of different languages that you can pass out to parents uh, if you so choose. Moving on to our last main topic, which is nutrition and feeding. So nutritional requirements in infancy, children under the age of two years old need more fat in their diet than any other age group. They also need carbohydrates, also known as sugar, which is why we think children tend to like sugar a lot is because um, your brain uses a lot of sugar, uh, a lot of glucose in its processes. And while it is rapidly developing, it needs lots and lots of energy, aka lots and lots of sugar. Um, there are different types of sugar. We're not going to go about talk about that in this course. 
However, um, it's a healthy balance. We're not, I'm not going to get into this. Uh, and then breast milk. So until the age of about four to six months, uh, infants can get all of their nutritional requirements through breast milk or formula. Breast milk is super duper cool because it can like its composition can change and it's the ratios of like water and fat and uh, antibodies and stuff like that can change based off of um, where the infant is at. Uh, development wise, if the mom is sick or not, if the baby is sick or not. Um, yeah, breast milk, super duper cool. Uh, according to most experts, human milk is the preferred form of feeding for infants. So please do not try to feed an infant almond milk when they are um, supposed to be drinking breast milk or formula. More nutrition and feeding, uh, nutritional requirements. We did infanthood, now we're moving on to toddlerhood. So overweight and obesity are growing concerns in the United States, even among young children. Um, also, the most common nutrients that is missing from a US toddler's diet uh, include iron, zinc, and calcium. There's also a problem of malnutrition in the United States, as well as other countries. Uh, infants and young children are more success susceptible than older children to growth impairments or being their growth being stunted, things like that, um, due to malnutrition. So in the United States and worldwide, infants and young children suffer from problems related to an insufficient amount of food or an in inadequate intake of essential nutrients, protein, and calories. The greatest needs are in countries suffering from food shortages or famine due to emergencies, war, or agricultural problems caused by extreme drought or flooding. So we have reached the end of our medium lecture. This is no longer a mini lecture. Um, thank you for sticking with me throughout this. I know it was very um, academic heavy, very just lots of information thrown at you. Um, however, I do recommend that you read the readings, take notes. Um, and if you would like to further your research, watch videos on the topic, it's a very interesting topic. Um, so. In summary, we have gone over physical growth, health and safety, and nutrition and feeding. That is all for this week. I hope everybody has an absolutely fantastic week. I will see everybody next week. And if, as always, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, suggestions, just want to chat, um, I am here. Just email me or message me. Um, I am here to support you in your learning. Um, so anything you need, let me know. That is all for this week. And like I said before, I hope everybody has an absolutely fabulous week.